This is the state deciding who's got a right to live in this country, who hasn't. Anyone with a detention centre is a terrorist. Anyone with a detention centre is not wanted in the UK. It's an invalid. Get him out of here. The people who are locked up in these um, uh, centres that you're referring to should think it all out and realise they've got no future in Britain. In 2017, that was last year, I was arrested. I mean, you're detained when you go to sign. You're trying to comply with the immigration bail conditions that have been given you, one of which is signing. I started asking questions. Are you going to lock me up? They were like, no, 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 don't worry. Just 10 minutes, we'll take you to the station. You are going to sign and you're taken, detained, arrested, put in a van that has no windows and you're driven to somewhere you have no idea, your family has no idea. At 5.30 they came to me, you've been detained, and that was when my whole, I don't know, it's like my body left, my spirit left my body, I don't know how to explain it. I started crying, what's now? So can you explain for us what are immigration detention centres? Well, they're places that people are held in pending removal or deportation. You can also be held in detention to assess whether or not you have the right to be in the UK. So how many detention centres are there in the UK? There are eight currently. Eight, okay. One of those is in Scotland. They are designed to prison specification, uh, category B, I believe, so quite high security establishments. If you've been in a prison, uh, and then you're moved to an immigration removal centre. I think you think you've just been moved from one prison to another. People are obviously denied their, their liberty. They are separated from their family and friends, their support networks, uh, often you know, hundreds of miles away from their families, so they can't get regular visitors. In detention centre, you had asylum seekers, you had overstayers, and you had convicted criminals. They bunch, pack them all together, throw them in the same place. You share a room with some other person. It's not your choice who shares the room with you. You take countries who have been in wars for centuries. You take countries who have intertribal wars. You put these people together. You lock them in the same room. Detention should be used to affect removal. Mm. We know that unfortunately that's not always the case. That's why there's instances of people who have been detained for years. We have had clients in the past that have been detained for five years. I think the fact that we have indefinite detention in this country means that it's an uh, easy default um, as part of the enforcement process for the Home Office just to pick people up, put them in detention and leave them there. And in some cases leave them there not only for months but in some cases for years. There is no justification for immigration into Britain whatsoever. We are a small island, we are densely populated and we don't actually need newcomers. As for the point there is no upper limit on how long these um, people can be kept, well I have no doubt that um, they are offered a, a ticket back home, I have no doubt about that. People have asked to leave, but the Home Office say you cannot buy your own ticket and leave. We will let you leave when we want to. People have asked to leave two months after they are still in detention centre. People have asked to leave five months after. Those who have been through it, describe it as worse than prison. And initially you kind of react against a statement like that until it's explained that if you're in prison, you at least know when you're going to get out and you count the days down. When you're in immigration detention, you never know when you're going to get out and you simply count the days up. And it's a hugely traumatic experience. The biggest stress maker the biggest problem is that uncertainty. There's no question that the uh, psychological toll of 
The uncertainty of immigration detention, the uncertainty about your, your status, separation from family and friends, uh, for some people the, the way out appears to be harming yourself or even risking taking your own life. So I don't think one can separate out the fact of immigration detention from uh, the, you know, these mental health outcomes. Every day people try to commit suicide, people try to kill themselves. It's just like everyone, everyone is just in their own world. There is this policy that the Home Office um, has in theory, which is around the intention was to reduce the detention of vulnerable people or adults at risk including survivors of torture and rape. But what we see in practice is that this just isn't working and that vulnerable women, women who've survived rape, women who've survived torture, women who've survived trafficking are still routinely being locked up. When I first started visiting Yarlswood Detention Centre, the government locked up around a thousand children a year. Even pregnant women could be locked up for any length of time. Had someone was, who was raped, parents killed in front of his eyes, he managed to escape. He want to deport this person. The person said the same people who are looking for me, why deport me? You're sending me to my dad, I could as well do it now. Jumped from the second floor and fell. And the Home Office is making no attempt to find out what their experiences are and how vulnerable they are. When I was claiming asylum, it gets to a part where I told them about what I went through, how I was tortured, how um, they used blade on me and stuff. Well, the onus is all on the woman to disclose it herself. The Home Office doesn't make any proactive attempt to screen women and find out how vulnerable they are. And what we find that even when a woman does disclose, so if she's locked up and then she does disclose to the doctors in detention and ask for what's called a Rule 35 report. A Rule 35 report is an examination by a doctor to take account of a history of what happened to them and the physical and psychological consequences. The Home Office so often doesn't take that seriously and she often remains in detention. A doctor examined my body from my head to toe, they count all the marks in my body and they write to the Home Office to say yes, a story corresponds with the mark on her body. Home Office said yes, we've seen the mark, you were tortured, yes, but we're still going to keep you here. The examination under Rule 35 is often utterly cursory and I've seen cases several where the doctor did not ask the patient to take off any clothing and therefore recorded only some of the visible scars and when I came and looked there were for example 37 undocumented cigarette burns. We have heard from LGBTQI detainees that they have not had access to their HIV treatment when they've been detained, that there's been delays in getting it. Failure to investigate and treat tuberculosis, uh, to investigate and treat outrageously severe hypertension, and many, many other simple medical problems that should not be missed in this way. But we've seen uh, uh, centres where staff are badly pay paid, badly managed, badly trained, and the consequences for the de detainees uh, is, uh, is serious. We've had stories from our clients that staff have um, harassed them or discriminated against them because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. It's because most of these guards who, come, who work in detention centre come from the prison system. They've been trained in prison, they've worked in prison, and they still have that mentality, treating us like criminals. Even some of the guards, they use the F word, they're like, I don't give a F, go and die. They do, they do say that to we, yes, because they've said it to me the, the first time I was not eating for like a month. While in there, I was not eating at all. And one of them was like, if you die, you lose. Some of them are power hungry, and they are very prepared to push the boundary, to abuse their power. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing is, there is nothing a detainee can do because you have no control. Sometimes you ask for stuff, but they mimic you, they laugh you, they bully you right there in the detention. Twice I tried to take my life, even right in detention. I tried to commit suicide because 
it's like it's worse it's like i'm reliving history it's just like history was replaying in my life And we know that even the, the people who were not allowed to work when they were at liberty, they are in fact put to work in the detention centre and paid only one pound per hour. You may be serving food to other detainees, you may be shaving the hair, you may be cleaning the places we live. Some of us tend to use every money we earn through competitions, through doing different odd jobs to send back to support our kids and families out here because being detained doesn't mean they should be detained. At the moment, detention centres are run by private profit-based companies such as Serco and G4S, which, I mean, British taxpayer money is going straight towards them, isn't it? Well, it is, and there's been some notable scandals uh, in terms of the way that uh, some of these centres have, uh, uh, have been operated. I've talked to some of the operators and they would uh, say that the Home Office bears some responsibility as well because of the way in which they have tied down those contracts. The Home Office is the, is, the, is the customer. The Home Office decides what it wants to contract and what price it's willing to pay. So as a consequence, it is the Home Office, its decisions, that determine what the companies uh, deliver. If the companies are asked to deliver more and they're going to be paid more for it, they'll be happy to do that. Everything that the Home Office does is uh, obviously set against the target of um, reducing uh, net migration from hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands, which was a foolish target to set and has been spectacularly uh, failed in every one of the eight years the government has had it. Um, it's also led to the hostile environment which frames the Home Office approach to so very many issues. The hostile environment is um, a term coined by Theresa May when she was then Home Secretary in 2012. And her policy was designed to make the UK an unpleasant place for people to live if they didn't have the right to be here. It really kind of started with the go home bans, which we all saw back in 2012 or thereabouts. That was kind of a starting point, and then we had two key pieces of legislation. We had the Immigration Act 2014, followed by the Immigration Act 2016. And this really brought in the, the hostile environment policies. So this was the government aiming to turn lay people, such as doctors, bank managers, landlords, into border officials. And we know that in practice, that leads to people being scared to seek out medical help when they are in dire need of it. Um, we have had recent examples of people who have died as a result of that. Scenario of someone going to the hospital because the wife is in labour. As for identification, they couldn't put the wife in detention because she was with Baba giving birth. The man was taken to detention. But as we've seen with, with the Windrush generation, these, these were people who had the right to be here, yet were finding themselves in a position where they were detained and forcibly removed. We have over 3 million EU citizens who are extremely worried about their position. Because already uh, the Home Office is detaining thousands, thousands of EA nationals and removing them. I do remember sharing a room at one point with an 18-year-old from Germany. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, do I parent this child or what? Because he's sobbing, he's in distress, he's lost it completely. Deep down in my mind, I'm thinking, this is not humane, this is not right. This kid shouldn't be here. This kid is still growing up. What are you trying to, I mean, what type of future are you creating? Tomorrow's future is damaged. How would you respond to someone who says, we need to keep control of our borders and we need a cap on immigration? Detention centres are just a part of this. Well, we do need to control our borders. Um, any modern state does, and you can have a range of policies in terms of how you choose to exercise that control. Um, but we are also a country which has prided itself on welcoming people um, who are seeking asylum, fleeing conflict, fleeing persecution, and ensuring that their applications are considered properly. If in the West we go to work in the Gulf or in India or wherever, we're called expatriates and we're treated as sort of these conquering heroes, you know, dispensing our skills from on high to these poor people who need our help. Anyone who comes to Britain, let's say for a better life, 
are called economic migrants, but that's a pejorative term. But what about the fact that as British citizens we can move to near enough any country and we are welcome so I can move to Dubai and be welcomed as a citizen there? Well, I've got no comment. So can we discuss some of the alternatives to detention? So maybe a, a community-based approach like in Sweden, as you say? Well, Sweden, Australia, which is renowned for its um, tough immigration policy, also has a community-based uh, approach. Um, and what that basically means is that instead of, as a default, banging people up in an immigration uh, detention centre, um, you are working with them in the community, supporting them in the community, uh, to, during that period in which their case is being considered. And what we found was that not only is that more humanitarian approach, um, which reflects our values uh, better, but it's also more effective. If only half the people in detention are removed, um, I think we ought to be able to show that half the people who are subject to alternative detention can be successfully removed as well. But I now have my leave to remain granted by a court. Why was I nine months in detention centre when my story hasn't changed from the day I was taken in? We should be supporting these women to rebuild their lives and move forward they can help show us a way to a more equal future.